Welcome to episode 50 of the Empowering Ability Podcast. Welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast, where we get you and your loved ones impacted by disability the information needed to live a full and meaningful life. Now, here is your host, Eric Gall. Welcome to another episode of the Empowering Ability Podcast. And this episode is just not another episode for me. Um, Episode 50, I think, is a pretty cool milestone uh, to celebrate. So over the last year and a half, share with you 50 different podcasts, um, a couple of repeat guests, um, which has also been awesome, but just super excited to celebrate episode 50. And um, we have a great guest here uh, coming on the podcast today, Donna Thompson, and uh, excited to share this conversation with Donna with you. But uh, just on the the topic of episode 50, um, I would love to hear from you, the listeners. I love getting email um, share with you sharing, you know, what has been really valuable um, for you on the podcast, or just simply to say hi, letting me know that, uh, that you're there. And yeah, so send me an email, uh, send me, uh, just drop me a note and help me celebrate episode 50. Uh, and you can do that just by going to empoweringability.org and you just use the contact form there and uh, that'll show up on my email. So looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, so the other little piece of housekeeping that I wanted to cover today is, uh, you've probably heard this from me in other recent episodes, is that I'm going to be providing you a way to contribute to this work. So if you are uh, getting value from this podcast and you would like to um, find a way to contribute back towards this work. Uh, I'm going to be providing that to you. So more details coming on that uh, in the next podcast, uh, which I'm excited to to bring you in a few weeks. So stay tuned on that. And um, yeah, different ways to, to contribute if you're an individual family or an organization um, that's sharing this podcast with, uh, with supporters of people that um, have disabilities. So uh, that's all the housekeeping that I had for today. Uh, Today's guest, as I mentioned, is Donna Thompson. And Donna is an author and a speaker on issues relating to family health care, disability, and aging. Um, She is also a uh, mother to a son that has a developmental disability. So in this podcast, we dive into the topic of caregiving and It's a topic that really um, opened my eyes in terms of how we are all caregivers. And Donna shares a really great perspective around this. Donna also shares um, from her perspective what it has been like to be a mother with a child that has uh, disabilities uh, and medical needs and helps to shed some perspective on that for us, um, which I found very, uh, very helpful personally. Uh, She also shares about her new book that's coming up and um, there's some great information that uh, that's going to be in there. And so uh, without any further delay, here's Donna Thompson. Hey, Donna. Welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast. Happy to have you today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Awesome. So I recently uh, read your book, uh, The Four Walls of My Freedom, and um, I'm super grateful for you sharing your story and all the frameworks and concepts within the book. And I guess just to start off to to share with the audience today, um, I think the thing that hit me the hardest or that really resonated with me the most, Donna, was really you sharing your perspective as a mother, um, mothering a child with uh, with medical needs. And in your book, you say that it's a very public but lonely endeavor. And I was hoping that you could share a little bit about that experience um, to hopefully give others that perspective that you've that you share in your book and that you've been able to give me. Um, And also maybe other mothers will be able to connect connect with your experience and and maybe not feel so alone in that experience. So so could you share a little bit um, about about your experience as a mother? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Well, what's going through my mind as I'm listening to you uh, right now is that, you know, the idea of being, both public and exposed 
and and lonely at the same time. I think that's because as soon as a uh, a child baby uh, is 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 diagnosed with a disability. In our case, our son has severe cerebral palsy, um, epilepsy. Um, he has multiple diagnoses. He's medically complex. Um, so we received a diagnosis at about four months of age. We didn't know at birth that he had a, a disability. And um, so when we got the disability, all of a sudden, it was almost as if Nicholas, our son, became the property of health care and social care systems. So we began to be assessed. Nicholas was examined, tested, assessed. I felt as though I was under a microscope. Um, I think that it's the most destabilizing. And, and on one side, you know, you're very grateful for assistance because all of these assessments and all of this assistance is really what you feel is the key to um, the future success of your child. So you need all these things. At the same time, you want to present as a competent parent. Um, then a little later, you learn that in presenting as a competent parent, you're, you, that's reason for people to abandon you. So if you're doing very well, they're not going to help you. Um, you seem to be doing fine. You look so great. You're really pulled together. I would get dressed up to go to doctor appointments. I would dress my baby up in, in his finest. I would put a smile on my face and say that we are fine, he's beautiful, he's perfect. And I didn't realize until later that in order to actually access the help you need at home, you need to demonstrate failure as a parent. Um, so I didn't quite kind of figure that out <laughs> until much later. Um, so I think it, it's in, in living, um, sort of saying I'm fine all the time while they're testing your baby's vision, mobility, intelligence, um, uh, reflexes, everything. Um, and all the while wondering this, the school, what do his scores on these tests? What do they say about me as a parent? in the most important role in my life. Um, am I a success or am I a failure? I have no idea and I don't want to ask anybody. I am so afraid of the answer. So I think it's um, it's very strange experience. And what it does though is push you closer together with your baby. We were in this intimate, intimate um, relationship where the only time we could really be us was as a family at home, close the doors, lock the windows, um, pull the curtains. Nobody could judge. Hmm. So yeah. it's interesting. It, it sounds like, and I'm interested on your, your thoughts on this or your opinion. Do you feel that the the system or the medical system pushed you towards victimhood like push you towards i need to like you mentioned i need to present myself as a failure um so do you feel that you know even though you were you know trying to act strong or present yourself as strong present nicholas as strong like things are going well you know i'm gonna bring my best and you weren't getting your support getting any getting the support that that you and nicholas actually needed um you had to go in looking like a failure and essentially you know, more or less, I, I, the, the, the word that came to me was, was victim, like act like a victim to get what you needed. Do you feel that the system pushed you into that? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, it's not exactly being a victim. What it 
what it is more like the way the system works, I think, particularly if you have very high needs, I can speak to my own experience as a mother of a child with very, very high needs. So Nicholas needed somebody to stay awake all night um, with him to monitor respiration, seizures, um, positioning, very frequent positioning in bed. And, and um, there was a lot of screaming at night and so and then of course there was very busy days as well so it was a recipe for extreme kind of exhaustion and burnout so in any case I think that what happens is that people on an individual level in the healthcare systems and in social services are very kind and supportive and friendly and all of that I think collectively, though, um, what happens is that the maximum levels of help that you're eligible for in Ontario, where we live, um, are, are quite low. And so we maxed out what the system had to offer, and it came nowhere near to meeting the kind of needs that we had, particularly around night nursing. And so I think what needed to happen, and this is about the system, it's not about individuals working in it. What needed to happen is that we needed to become more costly to the system in terms of the crisis that we were in than it would be to give us a deal that met our needs. So we had to really demonstrate that we were crashing and burning in order for maximum levels of help to be exceeded. That's the way the system works. Um, so they'll tell you you're doing fine um, until you call them too many times crying and you call your MP and you do whatever it is that that is um, like a stick in in their side that keeps bothering them and finally they will meet your needs. Mm -hmm. So that's the way the system works and when I coach families in advocacy um, we talk a lot about presentation, about where your needs are, how you can creatively um, have a balanced life, leveraging community resources instead of, um, say, nursing home care, uh, whatever. As as it was, we needed nursing, so that's a particular thing we could only get from the Ministry of Health uh, because we certainly couldn't afford to pay for private nursing. The level that we needed it in and what happened with our family is that we went through a prolonged appeal process with the province uh, that we eventually won and so we did get our needs met but along the way I was observing how the systems work for families and I can tell you unequivocally that if your needs are so high that they exceed the maximum levels of service that are available to it, the highest needs, and they're still nowhere near meeting your needs as a family, then these are the cases that go to, to the ombudsman, uh, provincial ombudsman, or to the child advocate for the province. So I think our family case was very extreme. And so my idea was that I thought if I looked at our family experience and kind of really did a, a postmortem on all of the programs and services that we received or did not receive, including those in the community, like our local community center, um, local after school programs we were able to access, all kinds of things. If if I was able to look at those and determine what was helpful and what was not helpful, even in an extreme case, I thought that might be 
a worthwhile thing to do so that people could advocate more effectively for their own families and policymakers could look at our experience and learn from it. Right. So you took that, you know, your life experience and you started using it as a tool for others to to learn from. So can you speak yeah. can you speak to to that work that you're doing as as an activist and 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 uh, the work that you're doing with the family movement? Sure. Well, I began in the family movement as a co-founder of Lifetime Networks Ottawa, which is a an affiliate of Planned Lifetime Advocacy Networks from Vancouver. Um, so, uh, I began to be interested shortly after Nicholas was born, really, in inclusion. And I wanted him in the community. I wanted him to be in mainstream schools. Um, I wanted him to be contributing citizen throughout his life, and I wanted to give him the best start in order to be able to do that. So plan and and the plan movement and the family movement is really all about contribution and about citizenship. So I began to be very active in that. Then um, I uh, uh, had a conversation around about the time it was after Nicholas had graduated already from high school. Um, and I was, I was thinking at that time, you know, that we had done a pretty good job of bringing up Nicholas and that he had survived against all odds and that he was living a life that he valued and was, was really thriving at home with us. So, I had a conversation, I just happened to have a conversation with someone who began to tell me about uh, the work of an Indian economist who had won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1998. And this man, Amartya Sen, developed an approach called the capability approach, which looks at how people can be supported by their community and by the state um, to have a life that they value. So it's about individual choice and being supported to have a life that you value within circumstances of adversity. So Amartya Sen was looking at extreme poverty in India, but I thought I could look at his approach and use it as a tool to assess our family life in Canada with disability. And so that's what I did. I used that approach in my book to determine how people can be, can make personal choices, express their personal values and be supported to live in the community to do that. Yeah. I think just a couple of important things that you mentioned there, Donna, uh, and the first one being around inclusion. So you mentioned that, that Nicholas has a lot of medical needs. And I think I I, I see a a lot of families that have a son or a daughter with a lot of medical needs struggle with that inclusion piece. I see people kind of skipping over it as, oh, that's, that's not really, really realistic, or that's not really possible. And this isn't everybody. But I see that mentality out there. So I, I think that you, sh- you know, Nick, the, s- the story of your family and, and Nicholas is is a good example for families to hear because in your book you share that uh, you know a lot of the time Nicholas is laying down and that's the most comfortable place for him to be in. So you know, an individual that's that's laying down right uh, a lot of the time, how do you figure out the inclusion piece for them? And and you know, Nicholas has been able to do that. And your family's been able to do that in your own way. So I think that's just an important thing to highlight and, and to share for families that uh, the inclusion piece uh, or inc- that inclusion is is for everybody. Uh, 
And it doesn't, even if you have a lot of medical needs or whatever the circumstances are, um, it's still possible to achieve that. Yeah. I, you know, it's, I, I, I would never ever be prescriptive um, to other families about, you know, in, inclusion or, or anything else. I think it's very important for families to be able to express their values in parenting, um, period. I think that a lot of times your values are um, not considered to be an important element in parenting because there is a lot of talk about um, inclusion versus uh, segregated settings or there's, an, you know, um, it, it, it it's about living at home versus placement. All, all of these issues are highly, highly individual and dependent on many things. And, you know, I was the queen bee of mainstream schooling for Nicholas. And on two occasions, I took him out of the mainstream and put him in special schools. And you know, a lot of my friends said, how could you do that? That's heresy. And I said, no, um, both of the times that we did that, and it was for a short time, but both of the times we had different reasons. The first time we put Nicholas in a special school was to learn a particular skill. And I said to Nicholas, you're not going to be in the neighborhood school for a while because you're you know how some kids go to hockey school you're going to hockey school except that it's not hockey it's conductive education and so we did conductive in a segregated setting very intensively for two years with very specific goals and goal posts of achievement most of which he did not achieve by the way <laughs> But I felt that it was important for him to learn uh, that he was a, the master of his own environment. And I felt his best chance of doing that was through conductive education. So it was a very personal choice. Mm -hmm. What I saw happening to him in a regular preschool was that he was becoming very happy as a very passive child. And when he went into the conductive education classroom, there were no wheelchairs allowed. It was all do it yourself, get from point A to point B, figure it out um, with wooden furniture. And, and it's, it's, a, it's an approach, mm -hmm. and which we tried. In any case, I think the point is that when Nicholas was in the mainstream, I also wanted him to have a community of people with disabilities. So we sent him to Easter Seal Camp for a couple of weeks in the summer, which he hated. He threw a fit when he, I mean, he did enjoy it once he got there, but dropping him off was kind of hell on wheels. He still has difficulty making friends with other people who have disabilities, and that makes me sad because he has the potential to have that as a community within his larger community. But I have encouraged him to explore his community, which he's doing now, look for a job such as it is with his uh with a helper. He has a CV. He has um, many, many, many activities that he carries out from his bed. And he socializes a lot with friends and family. And, you know, over the years, I, I would say that, you know, I wanted more for him. I wanted I was just devastated when they told me he wouldn't be able to be up out of bed much anymore at the age of 16. And so consequently, 
he has found the four walls of his freedom. I mean, the four walls of my freedom was our house. What can I do with this? I can't leave the house. So how can I make a rich world of happiness and joy and interest in my home? And he does it in his room Mm -hmm. from his bed. And he truly does. He, I mean, it's amazing. He writes a blog um, using his communication book, Dictating, uh, based on sports, which he knows everything about sports. And he uh, is the commissioner of multiple sports betting pools, um, online betting, my little criminal, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> He's just got so many interests, so many interests, and he's constantly got ideas of things that he wants to do, either online or with friends and family. Um, so he 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 is curious, and I think curiosity is a um, a very important element to having a rich and interesting life. If we could kind of stay in in that vein for a minute. One of the things you mentioned to me previously was, uh, along with with the the title of your book, um, "The Four Walls of My Freedom," you said you needed to find pleasure in peeling the damn potato. So yeah, you, that's right. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I I can. I remember. I didn't put this in the book, but. I remember where we lived. We lived in an apartment and Nicholas was, I guess, we lived there for five years and in this apartment and um, the shape of the apartment was such that I could look down from my kitchen window into the kitchen sink of the apartment directly below. I didn't know the people who lived there. But I watched that woman's hands peeling avocados. And she was the maid, I think. Her hands were working hands. But she was so good with the knife. And she could peel an avocado without breaking the skin. And it was almost like a balletic dance of the hands. And I remember thinking, that is so beautiful. I must try to be at the window and look at that again tomorrow. It became a voyeuristic thing that I really enjoyed watching her hands. Then I, then I thought to myself, I can do that. I, when I'm peeling vegetables, I began to First of all, experiment with how well I could peel them. Then I started thinking about this activity that I'm doing in preparing food is, first of all, it's sensual. Secondly, I'm feeding my children. And that meant so much to me because Nicholas could, is, is tube fed, but, and he had so much difficulty with chewing and swallowing. Um, as a child, but he eats for pleasure. So I would prepare him food and I began to link what I was doing with the purpose of it and the satisfaction of it on so many levels. And I began to think about the tiniest things that I was doing as forms of meditation. and. That made me happy. And I I wasn't doing anything differently. I was simply looking at myself doing my jobs of feeding my kids and cleaning the house and making the bed and all these simple activities as forms of meditation. It's interesting. It's like... And, uh, it kind of reminds me of um, the movie American Beauty with Kevin Spacey. So there's the, the grocery bag floating in the wind, right? And then there's the guy narrating over it. But it's finding the beauty in 
the ordinary or in in the mundane things in life? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, you know, Alet Mansky, the founder of Plan, calls champions in the um, in the family movement passionate ordinaries. The passionate ordinary and the resurrection of the ordinary. And even in my book, I recall, I wrote this, that I recalled reading um, a film review, and I don't remember the name of the movie, but I remember I was listening to the radio, and I was captivated by the story of the movie, which was about a nun who had come as a young woman to a monastery, and or a, an abbey, rather, and she was complaining about scrubbing pots. And the mother superior said to her, you mustn't complain about scrubbing those pots. There is great meaning in those pots. And, you know, that was about locating the extraordinary within the ordinary. And I think that is a, is a real challenge for people with disabilities and their families that we, because we have the benefit of the slow movement lived loud in our families. We do things more slowly. We're more contemplative. We do things more purposefully because we have to. Um, and so there is an opportunity for finding movement, you know, meaning and joy in, in that, the way we live. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so maybe let's switch gears, Donna. I know that you're writing a new book. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're writing about in that book? Yeah, I'd, I'd um, be happy to. So this new book is be before in in the four walls of my freedom. I that was a, it was a very political book. So I cherry picked um, events that had happened in our family to demonstrate ideas of how I thought people should be supported um, in the community. Uh, to live well, even though they had dependency needs. So this time, I'm co-writing with um, Dr. Zachary White, who is a professor of communications at Queen's University in um, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And Zachary and I are writing a book about caregiver identity and how that how it's so difficult to find the language to express the transit, the transformations that happen to someone when they're giving high levels of, of care to someone they love, or even maybe someone they don't love, but giving a lot of care. So um, a lot of things change, lots of things grow and lots of things die in you personally when you become immersed in giving care to someone. And so we're talking about what happens to somebody too often. You know, you can never say that, that what we're talking about is going to be true of everyone. Of course it isn't. But as I said in an email this morning to Zachary, this is mostly true for most people most of the time. Over the years, this is what we have discovered. And so there's no doubt that giving care to someone changes everything. It changes your past, it changes your present, and it changes your future. So, and it changes your relationships profoundly. So we're talking about that and giving language to it. Because mo a lot of times people will say, well, what do you do? Um, or how do you feel about looking after your mother now that she got Alzheimer's? Like, how's that going? Or 
or even um, people who volunteer in hospice. Like, wh why do you do that? What is it about that that no one seems to have the language to describe how they feel, what it is, the, the double-edged sword of burden and joy. It's so fraught, the language behind these discussions, that you could be betraying the person you love if you say that he or she is a burden. So I'm just not going to say anything. If I say that I love working, volunteering in the hospice, people will think that I enjoy watching people dying, which I don't. It's, it's about the life before death. It, all these complex Greek epic realities of life, you know, on the edge, because that's what it is when you're looking after someone, you're facing your own mortality, you're a dealing often with life death situations, you're extremely intimate, you're breaking the rules of, of what we think of as dignity when you're bathing your father, for example. So there are all these complex realities. And so we became very interested in the language. How can we help people express what's going on so privately in their lives? And once you begin to have the language, then you can form a personal narrative of your life. And you can make peace with the now of your life, hopefully. Instead of always saying, oh, when this is over, that's when my life is really going to begin. Um, finding a way to locate meaning in the now and find out where your life is with respect to the person before care, the person that comes after caring, and rationalize it all. Um, so my part of the book is what next? Once you've got the language, once you've got the personal narrative, what can you do now to be an advocate, uh, to, to take action? And so my part of the book is about personal support networks. What are the assets in your community? Um, how to use online tools, including support groups. So my part is just the most pragmatic. This, These are some ideas of actions that you can take to thrive within circumstances of, ability, of adversity with a team of people who have stepped up to commit to help you. Um, so that's that's what it is. So I think we're we're going to probably call the book something like Transformations in Caregiving uh, from Loved One to Caregiver, something like that. But it's about transformations. Right. And I, I think you're on to something with the language piece, because reflecting, you and I had a, a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and we're talking about language, this exact thing, and and caregiving. And it hit me as like, holy crap, I'm a caregiver. <laughs> and I just had never, for whatever reason, I hadn't considered myself one, but I am. So with my sure, sister, so, of course. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, just that language piece and, and, and telling that personal narrative, personal story. And, and I think a piece of that is accepting it and and embracing it and yeah. and like you said living in the now not waiting for for that future life or that other life like enjoy the life that you have now um and finding ways to do that i i think that's important work that you're doing with that and um and the other piece around the the tools right and, and how to um build that again kind of using that capability approach language but building that life that the person values um, and having a team of, of people or your network uh, around you and your community to do that. I, I think, you know, as a broad principle is very important, but um, I know you're diving in deeper with, you know, the, the frameworks of 
asset-based community development and, you know, support networks, like you mentioned. Um, so yeah, super important work and grateful that you're, you're sharing that. I'm excited to, to read the book. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. I, I think, um, you know, I just, I guess I wanted to say that the word caregiver, it's no wonder that you didn't identify with the word caregiver, because I think it's a very bad word. We just don't have a better word. Um, I know Vicki Kamak um, from Plan uh, has been, and she and I have written about this too. We, we, we like to use the word natural care. Um, and, but you, I guess you could say, you know, you could say compassionate care, kindness and care, but at the end of the day, we're talking about dependency, dependency needs being met by somebody else. Um, where, and so of course, children have dependency needs and, um, you know, my father, who was perfectly able-bodied until the age of 52, when he had a stroke, developed dependency needs. Um, my mother, who's 96, now has significant dependency needs. She can't do many things on her own that she used to be able to. So the people who look after her, what what do you want to call them? It's me, my sister, but she has paid helpers too, who are in her inner circle of care. We're all kind of holding hands together to, to try to give her the best life that we can. And we're doing that with our son, Nicholas too. So the only word I can think of is caregiver. And I think that's a word, and we argue this in the book, that is that applies to everybody. Because there isn't anybody who isn't looking at, except for a baby, but there isn't anybody who isn't looking after a pet, um, a friend, uh, who we, we, we all look after each other naturally, even when we're perfectly healthy at the prime of our lives, we're constantly looking after each other at work, at home, uh, on our local baseball team, everywhere we are. I make dinner for you tonight. Um, you're not feeling good. I'll bring you over some soup. It's care. Right. So you, so I think you might've mentioned this earlier, but I don't know if you mentioned the why. So when you think of caregiving, you're not specifically thinking about disability, right? You're thinking about all different types of caregiving across different ages. And, you know, you're not looking at a diagnosis. So can you share why you think it's important to look at caregiving through that lens and um uh, maybe there's a personal answer but uh, if if you can share that and, and maybe there's a political answer to that as well the main answer to that is political because i think as an activist we are absolutely stronger if we begin to think about care the same way we think about the environment for example that it's something that needs to be paid attention to across levels of government. It needs, we need to get care and support for care for each other into the water supply. We need to get, we need to develop the analogy of the blue box for care. How do we, because right now we don't have it. If you have a sick child and you're at work, if you have a mother who has Alzheimer's or, God forbid, um, you know, a child with a disability or a sibling with a disability, and you're trying to go to work and explain to your boss why you have to take yet another day off because of hot clinic appointments or something, we don't have in our society anything that's embedded there to say, of course, of course, that's okay. That's what humans do. Of course. It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, the polar opposite of that. Um, we're supposed to be fictionally 
um, you know, prop up this fiction that we're healthy at the prime of our lives. Nobody ever gets sick. You've got your, you know, your, your iPhone and you're on call 24 seven texting two in the morning. No problem. I'm awake. You know, it, it, I, I never need to go to the bathroom. Um, you know, it's absurd. So we've gone, the pendulum has, has swung so far away from supporting care. But I think, um, I think the aging demographics in our society are going to help the pendulum swing back to the, um, to the imperative for supporting natural care in families and amongst friends so that maybe now what's going to happen is that corporations are going to buy block packages of agency hours so that you can buy care at home for your sick child, for your child with a disability, for your mother with dementia, for your husband who broke his leg. It's all the same. We all love the people we love and nobody is perpetually healthy and perpetually independent. So we have to figure out how to support care in our lives, full stop. And I think the best way to do that is to look at all the communities who are giving care and join up together. Right. And there's a power in that and there's political power within that, right? Because it impacts there's, everybody, not just a small, you know, niche group of people yeah. with disabilities. Yes, the, absolutely. Um, that's not to say, you know, I, I wrote just two days ago, a blog post about tribalism in the disability community. And I think we have tiny tribes within, like I have a tribe of people, other parents whose kids have the type of cerebral palsy that my son has. That's a community. Then there's the community of CP. Then there's the community of developmental disabilities generally. Then there's the, commu the community of adults with disabilities, parenting adults, you know. Then there's the community of disability generally, which fits into the community of caring and, and the circles get ever, ever bigger. But there's tiny circles that are communities within and identities, you know. So I have multiple identities and multiple communities that I fit in with. It's, it's funny though, um, because sometimes I'll have a conversation with an autism, uh, somebody in the autism community and, um, they'll say, well, you know, I really don't know anything about you or your life because your kid doesn't have autism. I, I really only understand autism. And my community is autism. And so there is that. And even the communities of people who believe in inclusion versus segregated settings, never the twain shall meet. They don't talk to each other. That's interesting. Like, I don't know what the right percentage is, but, you know, my bad is the experience and the emotions and the caregiving that you provide is, you know, probably... 80% the same and 20% different or something like that. Like, I think it's more similar than it is um, more different. For sure. And the care that I provide for my mother is very similar to what I do for our son. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we don't need yeah. a, a niche solution to the caregiving problem, right? Or, uh, you know, we don't need niche solutions for each diagnosis or each you know, for somebody that's aging versus somebody that has a intellectual or developmental disability, right? It's uh, what I'm hearing. Well, is I think, I think so sometimes we do, of course, sometimes we need individual solutions. Right. Sometimes we need diagnostic specific solutions. But when you're looking at issues that are so common, and I am most interested in those big commonalities because I think that's where we can achieve political change. Right. I, you know, you're not going to change the world based on an individual solution. 
well, maybe you can use it as a precedent course, but I think looking for um, solutions that work in some very fundamental way for hundreds of thousands of people, that is what really interests me, which is why I'm such a big fan of Al Mansky, for example, who founded the plan movement and the family movement and disability because it was his idea to create the registered disability savings plan. That was an idea that transformed possibility for people with disabilities in this country, you know, and the fact is that people with disability do not have to be poor anymore. Right. Um, so ideas like that, big change. That's what I like. Right. Yeah. And uh, for those of you interested in listening to more about Al, uh, I did do a podcast with Al. I think it's number 18. Uh, I'll reference that. And so another big idea that he's working on or, or, or thinking about and advocating for is things like basic income, right? So again, looking yes. at it from a poverty perspective rather than a disability perspective. And I think that's that's smart, right? Where's the common ground? And, um, you know, where, where can we get uh, politicians' attention? Um, so Donna, I really enjoyed our conversation today. And um, for those people that are listening and uh, interested in, in learning more about um, I guess there's a couple of things that we, a couple of ways we might be able to direct them to learn more about the things that you've done. So first there's the book, um, the four walls of my freedom, where would be the best location for people to pick that up? Uh, it's available at all major booksellers. Um, so, uh, you know, chapters, Indigo, Amazon, um, available in the United States through Barnes and Noble. It's, it's available everywhere. Okay. Awesome. So I recommend the book. It helped, as I mentioned earlier, it helped to give me uh, a lot of perspective. Um, so I think it can do the same for you. And um, the other one is your your blog. Uh, so can you tell us maybe a little bit about your blog? Who's it for? And um, what's the web address where people can, can go read it? Sure. It's called The Caregiver's Living Room. And there's a Facebook group. Um, page called the caregivers living room as well uh and uh the blog address is www.donnathompson.com and there's no p in my name so it's donna t-h-o-m-s-o-n.com and it's called the caregivers living room and i put up a new blog uh usually twice a week so I write quite often. Right now, over the summer, it might only be once a week because I'm writing my new book too. So, and you're at the cottage, so you, did, you did I enjoy am. that time, right? And and I have a new puppy too. So yeah, I can hear. Is that her in the background? We can hear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All <laughs> yeah. good. So uh, the other question that I wanted to have, if people have become interested in your new book uh do you have an idea when that might be available uh to folks spring 2019 okay awesome well i'm looking forward to reading that when it comes out so donna it's been a pleasure to to chat with you today and i look forward to our future conversations thank you so much and thank you for all that you do um because i i deeply appreciate all the work that you do to support families um, and siblings and people with disability uh, and um, just th the sharing of your personal journey too. So it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Donna. Big thank you to Donna Thompson for coming on the podcast and chatting with me. Uh, also, big thank you to Donna for all of our side chats and conversations that have been uh, super helpful for me and uh, and my family as we go through some transitions in care in our own family. So, Donna, thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for for that support. Um, so, what I just want you to leave you with and, and to consider is thinking about how you are a caregiver. Um, in this conversation with Donna and other conversations with Donna, what she helped me realize is that that I'm a caregiver. And it was powerful to, to realize that. And um, so I, I encourage you to think about how you are 
a caregiver. And I invite you to celebrate that. Celebrate the fact that you're a caregiver and, and not to, to fight it or deny it like I did. Um, and think about what are those benefits that caregiving, uh, being a caregiver brings into your life. Um, yeah. So thank you so much to, to Donna for coming on the podcast. And I've referenced her books and how to reach out to Donna, uh, her contact information and the great blog that she has. So feel free to check those out in the show notes. And next week, I'll be sharing how you can contribute to the podcast if it's something that uh, you desire to do uh, because you're getting so much value from it. And if uh, you're unable to contribute to the podcast, that's fine. Uh, it's always going to remain free. And if you got value from from this podcast, uh, one of the ways that you can support it is to share it with someone else. So uh, feel free to do that as well. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Uh, if you like this episode and you think you know someone that would benefit, please share it with them. Uh, be a part of the change to think differently about disability. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. Visit us at empoweringability.org for more podcasts and resources to help you and your loved ones impacted by disability build a full and meaningful life.